Hello, welcome everyone. We'll start in just another minute. As people are joining us. Bem-vindos, bem-vindas. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I will speak briefly, very brief in English. And Eu vou falar um pouquinho em inglês. In Portuguese. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Juliana. I work for Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden team in the Kaduri Earth Program for the past four years now. And I am from Brazil, I am Brazilian, so it especially gives me a huge pleasure to host our speaker today from Brazil, whose work I've known for many years now, Ailton Karnak. And so as I said, this talk will be conducted in Portuguese language with translation to English. You will find, so I'm speaking in English now to make sure that you uh, can find the interpretation icon that is in the bottom of your uh, Zoom. And when you click in the interpretation, then there will be the option for English, the English channel. And you will be there with uh, Fernanda, who is from Brazil, is actually in the same uh, state that Ailton is, and she will be um, translating for you. And if you have any technical difficulty, you can use the chat to select um, where you see KFBG. There's Jamie, Simon, and Natalie. There's three KFBG that you will find in the chat. And you can write for any, if you have any technical difficulty. It's lovely to see some uh, familiar faces from Hong Kong, from the UK, from Brazil. And I will now shift to Portuguese for us to continue and hope you found the interpretation. Ok, então eu vou seguir agora. Oh, now I'm going to continue in Portuguese. Essa talk, para quem... Essa, esse encontro de hoje, né? Quem, para quem está vindo, who is coming for the first time, this chat is organized by Kaduri Farm, Botanical Gardens in Hong Kong. And as we say, it is a botanic garden, but it's a very unusual uh, botanic garden. It's in the mountain, as you can see in the background. And more specifically, this chat is part of a program called Kadori Earth Program. And I invite all of you that don't know about it uh, to see it in our website. This is the fourth year in which we run the talks this space, online spaces for us to meet each other. They started over the pandemic, bringing voices from all over the world together. And these spaces are still inspirational and challenging in good ways uh, to try to bridge this fragmentation, the separation, artificial separation between humans and nature. We opened the talk this year in February with a theme on uh, indigenous knowledge with Colin Kemperbo from South Africa. And so today we have Ayutong uh, still in that topic. I was thinking today, this morning, preparing to give this welcome for you and introduce this talk. And I was thinking how incredible it is to, to have a voice literally from the other side of the world, uh, if we think of Hong Kong especially an indigenous voice. And what I feel every time I hear or, or listen and I read Ayuto is that he is also celebrating our existence, but also warning us at the same time. And this conversation is a celebration, maybe, before it was scheduled for the 22nd of April, which is Earth Day. And we had to, to shift the date 
And actually, maybe by moving the dates, it's also a way of saying, of affirming that Earth Day is every day. So it was the 22nd, it was yesterday, and it's today, and it's tomorrow as well, forever. And just before I give the, the stage to Ayutum, I just wanted to also bring, you know, talking about another side of the world, and maybe align with the, the topic of uh, the indigenous world from the Arctic to the Amazon. I think it's quite interesting the number of places of people here today. There's more people from Hong Kong, some people from other places in China, but also we are spread across the world. We have people from Macau, Taiwan, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, the UK, Italy, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, US, Canada, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand. And when I, I saw in the form, like people for, people didn't say New, Ze New Zealand, they said the original name of New Zealand in Maori. I had never been to New Zealand, so I had to Google that and I understood it was the, the, lang the name in Maori language. So it brought me exactly to our, to our theme today, this different sound, right? There's an indigenous world from the Arctic to the Amazon. So I'll stop talking now and before I present Ayuto, I'll just go over some practical issues uh, for Zoom. So we kindly invite you to leave your cameras open if possible, particularly if you're going to ask a question, because that reminds us the diversity. We were talking to Ayuto beforehand, which is this kind of virtuous space where that the mind occupies. But it's good to also remind ourselves we are bodies and unique. So the, the camera helps us with that, right? So, so when you can leave the camera open, this talk is being recorded and we're going to share by email with you. So you can listen again and you can also share. If you have any issues, please write in the chat and look for someone that has a key FBG name, Jamie, Sesma or Natalie. And they can help you if you send a message. And finally, yeah, Yotun is going to speak for about 30, 40 minutes, uh, according to the flow. And then we're going to have a little break, like two minutes break, just for those who need it. And then we're going to open for questions. For the questions, what we're going to do is that we ask you to type in the chat your question. You can type in Portuguese if you speak Portuguese. You can also type in English and I'll do the translation for Ayuto. Or you can you can type in, in Chinese and then the team of Kadori will translate that for English. So that's okay too. So now uh, I invite you during the talk, if you have questions and insights to share, uh, write them down during the talk and then you can ask at the end. So Ayutum, I have to introduce Ayutum. People who are from Brazil today, it requires no no introductions. Everyone knows who he is. But from people from across the world, I'll present uh, Ayutum. Ayutum is speaking from Minas Gerais state uh, in the middle Rio Doce. It's a river. Is where he was born in the Karnak indigenous uh, reservation. He has dedicated his life to the indigenous movement in different ways as an environmentalist, a philosopher, a poet, a writer. He was and still is um, a defensor of the indigenous people rights and he was fundamental so that the territorial rights of indigenous people were recognized in the Brazilian constitution of 1988. And he's also recently been awarded um, to join the Writing Academy of Brazil, writing books such as Ideas to Postpone the End of the World, and Tomorrow is Not for Sale, and Life is Not Useful, and Ancestral Future. You can find some of those in English already. With Dante's publisher, he created Selvagem, which is translated as wild, 
have been cultivated since 2018, articulating memories, knowledge, scientific understanding, academic understanding of indigenous people, and artistic uh, understandings also from different realms. It's an honor to have you here, Yilton. I give you the floor. É mudo. Será que alguém consegue, da equipe, consegue tirar ele? Just a second. Ailton is muted if anyone from the team could unmute him. Can you press, Ailton, the, the microphone so that we can hear you? Ah, uh, yeah. Now it works. We can hear you. Perfect. So I want just to start by saluting people here in Brazil this morning. It's a very bright, sunny day. I'm very honored to, with this meeting. I want to thank Juliana, Fernanda as well facilitating um, this communication today, right? It's such a joy to be here from all, all around the world, from our planet Earth, in this virtual conversation. I speak a bit slowly, I take some time, because we are in an intercultural exchange, right? We're people from different cultures, from different places of the world. And this experience is very unusual, right? This experience of communicating between different cultures like that of different places on earth. But our minds make it natural, but it's not that natural, it's unusual. Our mind is virtual, has that virtual quality. We could say perhaps that it's kind of a saw in advance all this technology that today speed us up, they're accelerating us. Our mind has foreseen that as something of our nature, actually. So I just want to reaffirm my joy to, to be with each one of you. And all the places that Juliana mentioned. We have people in the European continent, uh, but actually we have people that are in Asia, Asia, where maybe this uh, ancient tradition of meditation so the practice of meditation opens up a whole universe. The Western world doesn't meditate. The West goes to action, and that's a quite a distinguishing feature between those two worlds, let's say, let's call it worlds, uh, the Western and the Eastern world. Of course, it's very imprecise to say Eastern, but that's what we could, maybe what we can use today. And this understanding of a plurality of worlds is what inspired our meeting today. It could have happened on the 22nd, it's happening today. I already shared this purpose of celebrating Earth, this beautiful organism that makes us. 
As ilustrações que eu estou me utilizando para. I have some images to, to share today. Participam, de certa maneira, é, imagens. They are just images. Institui as nossas diferentes é, culturas no planeta. They're images that shows or makes our, our different cultures in the planet. So we say, you know, from the Arctic to the Amazon. And when we think about indigenous people, what does that mean? These people actually have different names, of course, in different continents, everywhere they have different names. So this this name indigenous people have been uh, established, including in the international original people's rights. And in some countries, this has been reflected in the changes. Changes in the interculture dialogue between communities that form the same society, like in Brazil. So indigenous people have, have been identified as original people. If we think of indigenous people or original people from the planet, it goes far beyond regions from the Arctic to the Amazon. Actually, all people in the earth can relate to this. So this civiliza civilizing experiences that have been produced over a thousand of years, that has produced a plurality and diversity of cultures and people across the globe, in little islands, in the whole continent. And the images that I'm gonna show today, just as support for our conversation, it's gonna identify our, our planet, this region, uh, the Amazon has been the focus of the climate discussion, obviously. This part of the world as well, represented here in South America, in which Brazil neighbors Chile, above Argentina, neighboring Colombia, Ecuador, with whom we share this vast region, the Amazon. So Amazon actually brings eight countries besides Brazil together in this great river basin. With forests and waters, the relevance of this forest to the planet today, as we face climate change, so maybe it's been kind of a given extreme uh, relevance, but it's also good maybe to say that the Arctic or the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific, all the oceans actually also have a key role in climate regulation, global climate regulation. So it's not, we can't really look at one part of our organism that regenerates everything else. The whole organism of Mother Earth works in a smart way for its self-regeneration. So I mentioned that I'm going to use these images um, in slides today, which is not something that actually I do. I usually don't use anything. I just communicate, especially when I'm in a monocultural space. I just speak 
I express what I think without using any other resources. Writing for me actually is a technique. It really requires of me a departure from my natural way of engaging in my daily life. I have published books, but curiously, they all started in talks and speeches that then are transcribed and edited, which I really, I, I'm really thankful to Anna Dantes, my colleague at Dantes Publishing House. And she's also supported me with the repertoire of images that show coaches from different people from around the world. We're going to see here. Uh, like the, the image we're going to see next is the one of our, of our planet. Understanding that these images that are in our artifacts, objects made from different cultures from around the globe. And there is like an astonishing revelation that these images bring, which is our journey as a species. We undertook a journey throughout history and time this cocoon, our body actually, which is a, maybe a cocoon or a ship, it moves, it travels across continents on the whole planet, producing this wonderful development, which is culture. Each of our people has produced images and artifacts and uh, symbols that maybe reveal what now we would call globalization. So this immense production of images and symbols, in a way, it brought forth for our grandparents this event of globalization, that this event that connects us to all in all places in the earth. So it is about this simultaneously, uh, the synchronicity of events that constitute us as peoples that then produce cultures and inside their cultures, they express themselves in, in different ways and sense making with art, with elements, cultural elements that are dear to each community. as if we were a star in a constellation, in a sky constellation, each one asking for exclusivity and potency. Each one asks for their own exclusivity of that knowledge, of that place, of that art of that expertise, if we could use that name. So this uh, requested singularity, uniqueness of each of us everywhere in the planet, it suggests that maybe somehow in our minds, we understood that we are a global, that we are a totality. Eu, 
talking to Anna, my colleague, we decided to call this indigenous people from the Arctic to the Amazon to this meeting today. Out of a wish, a desire to bring to a shared understanding, another understanding of the events that now affect us everywhere in the world in different ways and that are at the same time producing in us, all of us, a disturbing relationship with time as if the time in the, in which we lived in now currently everywhere was bringing us uh, Organização Mundial da Saúde é, reportou esse ano um fenômeno é, que parece que só aconteceu agora no século XXI, que é a indicação de que o diagnóstico mais crescente em todas as regiões do nosso planeta... So the, os... the growing diagnosis everywhere, in all people across the globe, is a mental illness is growing everywhere. Um, the health organization has identified as mental suffering. I was paying attention to this report from the World Health Organization. I was looking at signs of this tiredness uh, that's, that's also reaching my community here in Rio Doce but also communities elsewhere, communities in the Amazon forest, like the Yanomami people, the Kayapos, people that have over 160 ethnicities and people, and indigenous people that inhabited the Amazon river basin, but also in other regions of Brazil. Hundreds of other people that made up more than 300 small communities. And that forms the indigenous people of Brazil. Well, people, Juliana mentioned uh, people from New Zealand, the Tearoa, is the word that actually I heard in a international conference of indigenous people from the Pacific, South Pacific. So I was in Japan for this conference and I heard that word. I took part in that first conference and I met people uh, from Aotearoa. It was really good, it was a really good meeting. See, also to see their symbols that kind of identify the worldview, their singularity, and the different cultures. So these different cultures, we produce our self images, this, our narratives. And now with the resources that we have, uh, technology, we, we have this challenging world, what's called artificial intelligence. I was saying to Juliana before you join, that for me, what comes to mind is that The real experience we have today of producing artifacts, of producing objects, technical objects, maybe this experience was already foreseen in practices, ancient practices. 
from all different cultures. And I refer to meditation. So for us in the West, perhaps it's an exercise of ceasing noise and observing the mind. But in the West, that is a torture. This exercise is a torture for anyone because our natural environment, everything that takes us out of daily life, the way we make our worlds in our society, in our Western societies, thinking in Europe, but also thinking Americas, the American continent has been totally colonized by Europe. including in the way of thinking, uh, the way we think and make our worlds. So this idea of coloniality, of this long process of colonialism and occupation of new territories, new worlds by one single European cultural matrix, it created in America uh, a dynamics of reproduction of the same reproduction of that culture and maybe even highlighting that culture in this vast American continent. I never forget, I never forget that even though I was born in the small river basin in the southeast of Brazil, I am deeply implicated in the whole American continent with Latin America, but also with the whole continent. And that allows me to have conversations with many elements of the whole cultural ethnic diversity. So the images from uh, Totecas, Aztecs, the images that you can see were single elements of designs, of artifacts, of uh, a representation of beings that Juliana can now show in the next slide. So this is saying that images, they weave meaning into the narratives of all the Earth's peoples, forcing this vision and this experience that now it's a political economic phenomenon of globalization. But in the beginning of the nineties, when I first heard about globalization, I understood that there was a technical and economic phenomic phenomenon. These two powerful forces that move the world today, techni technical and economical forces, which have gained maybe uh, power. If you can show the next image. We can see the the power of this connection of economy and technology and how it has sped up the world. And the sequence of images that, that we can see here, it's meant to to offer each one of us here in this conversation images that maybe indicate diversity. But at the same time, the proximity of, of our self images produced in different places in the planet. <laughs> so Juliana can speed up the images for us to understand of what I'm trying to say. The images are just to support what I'm trying to say. Is this diversity, plurality? And at the same time, and we are producing singularities across the globe. It seems perhaps like a contradiction that that at the same time that our bodies across continents 
create this cultural ethnic diversity, it produces surprises for to all of us. When we look around us, we're being called forth for, to speed up, to speed our inner time of our cocoons or ships of our bodies. So we, we use this expression, cocoon and ship to our bodies. We do that to bring the understanding that we carry billions of other organisms. We share experiences with other organisms. They are not only our human body, but that actually makes us. And that connects us to everything else, with water, with the forest, with rivers, with rocks, with all that has material existence, that has substance. So our body, this cocoon, it's, it relates, it makes sense, it's affected all the time also by meanings and reflects this immense capacity. of flow, of interactions. We can see differences between these images, produced images and drawings, but there is a common There's maybe a quality, a common quality. I'll say quality, I use that. They bring forth this quality. That makes us all one single voice. There is an expression, one voice, one world. One world, one voice. It had such a big reach in the end of the 20th century, in the 90s, when we have the first climate conferences, the review and some mental patterns that place humans in the top and at the top of all the species in domination. The Anthropocene. So the awareness of or exacerbated uh, relevance of humans on top of all the organisms, non-human organisms. This is quite recent. Maybe it's something, maybe 30, 40 years that we developed this awareness. So not even half a century that we actually awoke to the scandal of imagining our cocoon or body, human body, as a, a isolated organism, intelligent and capable of acting. Uh, acting in this whole life cosmos as if it was a god a machine maybe a god machine or a machine god transforming eating separating cutting off all that exists and what we call planet earth which is an organism So this awareness at the end of the 20th century and entering the 21st century with the understanding that we're actually part of life in the planet. With so much diversity, plurality, and that we are translating in a way. The richness of this organism, Earth, 
this is new. At the end of the 80s, we acknowledged that this organism could be called Gaia, could be considered a living organism. Uh, a plurality of senses that make life and intelligence all the time, right? So that is, as, as different cultures in the world, when we started to feel the disturbance of a warming earth, the disturbance of pandemies, endemies, and also these other diagnoses that show we are producing this kind of mental current in the world that makes us ill. Mental suffering is that. We are in a frequency, mental frequency, in the whole planet that causes suffering. Maybe it's silent in how we consume in the world. Uh, Davico Penawa, an Yanomami indigenous people, a dear friend, we share a lot of uh, visions on what's the change that's been affected the whole planet. He says that we now, as people in the planet, We are now in the market economy. The market economy has come, has its, uh, his goal, its aim is material things, things made by ourselves, artifacts, rockets. Yesterday I saw a guy saying that he's gonna make a new Titanic and it's like a child playing of ruining the, the planet. The separation produced by ourselves. Throughout centuries of experimenting, experimenting cultures in different places of the globe that has metastasized It produced this uh, side effect. That can, can make us a cognitive virtuality. It can take us to a place in which maybe even if our minds didn't produce the disruption, This disruption that separates us from the body of the earth, it makes us think that there is a floating organism somewhere. And with a very serious observation that this, this body almost becomes just a head with very little skill or capacity of contact with the heart. The same way that mind and heart must be cared and, and they need attention to be harmonized, our total relationship with, with the earth, with the earth organism, demands of us, requires of us an affection, unwillingness from the heart, a poetics of existence. a genuine wish or desire to contribute to the production of worlds, not just a reproduction of this world. That we've been sharing for centuries and they're now maybe reaching its limits. And now we can represent it in this globalizing expression. If each culture 
of one of our indigenous people, people, we have this self images, we think of ourselves something. Together, we have the self image that's monstrous. It's a human kind that's punching the earth, bombing the earth. And healing other organisms as if we were aliens to this. As if it didn't hurt us to do this. If what happens to the rivers, the mountains didn't hurt me. What happens to the air that we breathe? It hurts me. It's painful to each one of us. Each one that's here today. Because it affects the body of the Mother Earth. This wonderful organism that produces us and that invites us to self creation of worlds, the self making of worlds. We're not alone. It's not something just of our minds. It's not a Cartesian idea. Think, therefore, I am. I think and then I make things. Uh -uh, that's not it. Can we shift? Can we change? Well, it really depends of each one's uh, intimate, intimate um, decision, disposition. Do we want to answer to Gaia's calls, this living organism is calling us to produce worlds? They are deeply implicated with her, deeply connected with diversity, polarity. In a, in a pacifist disposition, amorous disposition of acknowledging the singularity of each one of us. But also acknowledge the singularity of each organism, of each being. That will make medicine. There will be medicine for a world in a, in a obvious process of illness. The planet, the physical world. And maybe this is another expression I get from Copenhagen, Terra Planeta, Earth Planet. For me, it's a bit difficult to deal with other languages besides Yanomami. So David Kopenawa has challenges with other languages. So he creates this, this terms, uh, Earth Planet. And I think it's wonderful from his Cosmovision, his own uh, Yanomami Cosmovision. From that, then he can observe that that he can say Earth planet. So it's a revelation, perhaps, that our forebearers, our ancestors, all had a futuristic or anticipated vision of what we. Uh, with technology today, we understand that is a planet Earth. So they had this uh, diagnosis of the planet as an organism of Earth, but also a sensible understanding that we are the planet, that we are this organism, 
that we can have joy with the potency of life producing of earth. We can be implicated with earth, we can be affected by earth. So the same way we can uh, create this uh, stance of being against illness, against suffering, against war, we can we can make that movement that's against pain with the same intensity. We can shoot a feeling or produce a feeling of affection of this body, this cocoon of the humans of being connected, implicated with the cosmic life generation capacity that the planet Earth has. It doesn't stop producing. So this warning that perhaps in the next 50, 100 years, we might be missing all this prosperity, all this wonders that the earth provides to us, the oceans, the climate, this gardens, diverse gardens, multiple gardens of foods, of colors, of beauty, of everything we need so that our life is beautiful. So here in America, in, in in the region next to the Amazon River, we have the Andes. The Andes are home of many indigenous people and two cultures that originated from that region are the Aymara people with the Aymara language. They're people from the mountains and Quechua. Quechua goes across the whole Andes um, as a continental language. In those two languages, there is an expression, which is uh, bien vivi, bien vivi. In Aymara, is Sumakasai, which was translated to Spanish as Bien Vivi. In English, I think it has, people are still looking for, for the right meaning. It's the right livelihood, um, but it's not quite. But it's the sentiment of living in harmony with the organism of the earth. To live in harmony with the earth is a dance. Is a dance that creates local meaning to people's lives, creates communities, makes worlds, create worlds. And also generates a kind of energy, a wonderful energy of restoration that should be considered an opportunity for other people in other regions in the world to experiment this communion with Pachamama, which is also a very common uh, term in the Andes, but also in other, other countries of Latin America. It's a way to refer to the earth, to this organism, Mother Earth. Recall Sagan and his colleagues. In, in the West, in Europe, they talked about Gaia. At the end of the 70s, 80s, when they say that this organism has this uh, wondrous capacity of making meaning of self autopoietic, it's of self creation, our indigenous people across the globe 
had very similar expressions, their own expressions and terms for this world creation. And all the myths and the narratives and drawings and images, it's all there, all to, to facilitate our understanding. I could keep talking to you for more time, just out of the pleasure, the joy, the contentment that my cells feel, my mind, my body, this communion with you in different places of the world, different cultures. Because for me, it is as if it was a revelation that we are really this cocoon, this human cocoon, this ship, this body, traveling. traveling in this vast environment of the biosphere, this the scientists can describe as biosphere of the planet, our ship, our cocoon, inside this organism is creating culture, meaning, and revealing our own capacity of creating other worlds, better than the ones we are spending now. And that perhaps that shift our paradigms uh, and relationships with uh, products, with the ideas of uh, wealth, with this abstraction, which is a uh, human development index, that the UN insists in considering as a metric for progress and human development. But I, for me, I really have decided to confront it. To confront it. I say this idea of sustainability that is today at, at the core of this understanding of, of an inhab inhabitable world. And this term sustainability maybe has been used maybe too much. Uh, in imprecise ways as well, to the point that now it has lost its potency to communicate a feeling of co-responsibility with that too and with everything we eat, with where we consume, because we are consuming the planet. So as I said, I could keep talking for a long time. I really enjoyed this meeting, but now maybe I'll thank uh, and open to for a dialogue so we can chat, so we can have a dialogue. So I'd like you to accept my invitation for a conversation now. Thank you, Ayutum. We already have some questions. Uh, the conversation is already flowing. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted a little break, maybe two minutes now. So maybe we do that now. Just double checking. Yeah, you have just a, a quick little break whilst we gather the questions. You can add the questions to the chat in English or Chinese or Portuguese. So we have two questions already in the chat. One of them, can you hear me, Ayuta? Yeah, 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 I can. Maybe I went a bit over my time, but I hope that's okay. We are on, on time, don't worry. We have two questions here. One, uh, maybe is related to what you talk about, about sustainability. When something maybe is kind of a co-opt and it loses meaning and power, 
And this question, Veronica sends it and she's asking, so maybe in the last years, media has covered more indigenous people and indigenous cultures. Do you see this interest as something genuine or maybe something opportunistic? Do people that come to you, do they really want to learn from your world? So Veronica first, thank you for the question. It was Veronica, right? Yeah. I like this question because it allows us to create a kind of radar of this mind, a mind map of what happens with globalization. So we're all in the same frequency, involuntary frequency in the whole world. This interest with what indigenous people think, this novelty, let's say, it is connected to the market, to extractivism. It is an extractivist activity. The capitalist way of operating the world it consum consumes everything that's new, that's novelty. And uh, in a paradox, the future, which is ancestral, is now a novelty as well. Uh, there is a record um, of music, pop music, that's like at the level of Madonna. <laughs> So he has like a million, two million people at a concert. The title of his album is Ancestral Future. He borrowed uh, a title of a book of mine to his pop record, and that's extractivism. The same as the idea of sustainability that has um, eaten up and co-opt maybe many meanings, this world is interested in consuming novelties. And the irony is that our people are not novelty. We've been around for millennia. We are ancestrality in a very radical meaning of it. We want to be with Mother Earth. But the capitalist extractivism transforms everything in an object. And that's the point, no, that's the issue. Maybe I can go to the second question now. We have a question from Hal, wondering uh, when it was the last time that you, you Ayutung, felt disconnected from Mother Earth? And what have you done to find that connection again? Well, <laughs> the last time really that I felt that was when I was diagnosed of my physical health. I had a diagnosis, uh, the ones that shook every, every certainty that you have. I went to some medical procedures of Western medicine. And when I was confronted with this, um, the possibility of my cocoon, my body, not being able to cope by himself in, in the direction of resilience, of self-healing. And for me, there was a very short time experience, but very intense that maybe I can consider that the last time I was confronted with the this uncertainty. 
what I did is to dive into uncertainty. There is a booklet from a, an art exhibition and its uh, title was Living Uncertainty. I was one of the collaborators of this exhibition. And as some of the of the artists uh, that you saw, Jaides Bell, that you saw in the images, he was capable of of bringing these images of beauty and seriousness at the same time, showing this kind of disruption that we we are inside of now in which an object, an artifact, doesn't need our collaboration anymore. It self-reproduces. So the last of this device, the phone, produces the next. So the latest comes from the oldest. It's wonderful, but at the same time, it's a bit scary. It may suggest that everything that we imagine is fiction, already existed when our ancestors made this artifact that we, we showed here, the images we showed. So maybe in an ancient ancestrality, our species already imagined the events that we live now, in which machines are ahead of us. Are producing other worlds that are not ours, not of our choosing. This is a bit concerning to me. As like challenges, obstacles to regain communion and connection to life and the planet, we need to be able to deal with this complexity. This disruption, technical, technological disruption. Before, we could make all choices. But now, between our body and the earth, there is a machine. There is a machine operating between our body and the earth. And we need to be aware of that, of this fact and deal with it, not only with our minds, but with our heart as well. Our heart can help us reconnect. In some cultures, there is the, the term religion, which means religari, which means reconnect. In other cultures, there isn't maybe this idea of reconnection, of religion being this relinking, reconnection. But there's a willingness, a radical willingness of, of creating this effect in the world, of creating this poetics. And to me, that's the, that's the experience, that's the sense. There's some thinkers called poiesis or autopoiesis. The idea that the earth creates itself, creates us, teaches, teaches how to self-make ourselves, self-produce, and can give us answers. There are minds alone, not the heart alone, are capable of answering. <laughs> Go ahead, if I'm not making myself clear, if what I what I found to try to explain something, you can ask me, of course, so that our conversation is enriching. So I'll bring maybe another question connected to what you're saying. First, I thought it was really beautiful, uh, these two 
ideas of reconnection, of religiosity, of religion, and this contrast of this willingness, radical willingness of, of producing this world poetics that you mentioned, which is almost not needing to reconnect because it's already being produced together with the world. And that took me to a question. Anna Carla has a question. How can we change perception, but if we are totally disconnected of nature, how can that shift of perception happen? So how is that, that possibility alive? Is there the possibility of being 100% disconnected or is this connection always available? Is there maybe potential always available? So I guess all evidence, including from biology, archaeology, the possibilities are endless for connection. So if we don't want to be too technical, we can say connection, right? That is, we are so implicated in the world the a physician, a physician Marcel Iglesias, said that we are we are a cosmos. Um, we are a microcosmos. If we are particles, if we're stardust, It's actually not possible to imagine a total separation of anything. We could say organic, maybe. There is some organic in this belonging. And that we can renounce to. I say we belong to Earth, to the Earth organism, in a way that we can't give up. As much separation you think you live, you experience, you're gonna go back to being humans, no? To being soil. Once I used an expression, those homo sapiens. Because for, we can think we're separated, but when we close our cycles, we go back to the soil, right? We become food for, food for the earth. We have a lot of questions here. So I wanted maybe to bring one that came in, in English. So you say, thank you so much for this amazing talk. It was beautiful and inspiring. Linked to the question from Veronica. I would like to know from more your opinion, how you think is the best way to restoration and conservation projects that want to preserve nature, to connect to indigenous cultures in meaningful ways. so that we can truly bring together diverse cultures for making progress in biodiversity conservation. It's a very rich conversation because that's in Kadori, we're doing these talks on conservation uh, is connected to that, but we're connecting to you. Well, whilst, well, whilst I was listening to the question, I was thinking, I was trying to imagine how this cultural diversity or this plurality that's here in, the, in this meeting of different people across the world, how is that reflected? How that reflects 
the way of being in the earth. So we, we talked about Ben Vivier from the Anges. That way of being in the earth is maybe something we can consider is an effort of being to the liking of the earth. Whereas other ways of being in the earth now is to make earth the way we want it to be. When we think about conservation, we need to think, are we acting to the liking of the earth? Or am I acting to, sh to shape earth to my liking? Because earth's living organism has its own dance, its own movement and dynamics. And it's not conservative actually. Gaia is an explosion of life. I'm like in wonder to think that uh, Gaia is this explosion of life. And when we want to act culturally and we bring these ideas of conservation or even restoration, are we acting on top of an organism and if it was a platform in which we're going to fiddle, we're going to modulate that platform. And that's why I say we need to think if we're able to be of the liking of the earth. If we can do that, we're going to listen more, what it's teaching us, and then we're going to move together with it, within it, cocooned. This concept that I brought, this uh, cocoon sheep, ship which is our body represented in symbols and artifacts and drawings. And it, take, it takes me to an image that wasn't shared here, but that for me is quite revealing. So maybe a thousand seven hundred years ago, so before Christian time, There was a Toltec culture. So maybe even before Toltecs, they left a graveyard with a lid on, something on the top. And the drawing was of an astronaut. An astronaut inside a ship totally fitted in the ship with all the technology that we see only now. And it could be compared compared to that image of maybe that movie. I think it's melancholy, but I'm not sure. A ship with bodies inside a rocket in space. And that image existed more than a thousand years ago. Why do we think we can restore the earth or preserve it? It's because we are very disconnected from the organic function, life function of life producing capacities of Gaia. So we don't want to be human sapiens. We want to say homo sapiens. we keep expressing this idea, this identity of homo sapiens, then this willingness to be the earth humus. So it is to say I'm a volunteer, but it's not true. It's a lie. What's at the core is the desire to control, to self-affirmation, 
think that we're going to preserve uh, biological dynamics that actually produce this. That's why there's hurricanes, volcanes, earthquakes, tsunamis. It's earth. It's earth producing meaning, moving itself. And then we say, oh no, let's preserve it. That's a joke. The only thing we can do is to listen to the earth. It has to be like a song. <laughs> it should be a song listening to the earth and not preserving the earth. This is making a joke with the Brazilian song that talks about preserving the earth, but he's saying you should be listening to the earth and not preserving the earth. Like cease the mind a bit, stop the mind. So before you meditate, we should maybe have this disposition of allowing the earth to speak, to listening to the earth. We're reaching the end of our conversation. We have a few minutes, but we could keep going. There are many questions still coming our way. I want to apologize for those that maybe we can't uh, answer your questions. Some questions about justice, about communication and indigenous communication. So they're very rich questions, but as you mentioned now, Contemplation and meditation, just listening to the earth. I will actually bring two questions that came up uh, twice from different people. They are, are about meditation. But trying to understand first, if you meditate and what's your meditation, what's it like for you? And if you think meditation is something important for our current time, for modern times. So maybe we can finish with this one. To meditate, maybe. is perhaps this journey from this place of separation. is a journey towards unity. I used to try very hard to meditate. I thought it was a manual for meditation. And I got tired of it. I tried for many decades. I'm about to turn 61. So for many decades, when I was young, so I thought I need to learn how to meditate. But fortunately, I saw there was bollocks. We don't learn to meditate. And I was actually experimenting organically this way of moving into this willingness to be to the earth's liking. It doesn't matter if you're in the ocean, in an island in South Pacific, or in the Andes, or where I am in the Rio Doce. And that willingness, um, disposition to be of the earth liking, that gave me the experience to, to affirm that the river that we share with 200,000 people, when this river was suddenly invaded by mud in a mining disaster that made life unviable, any use. 600 uh, kilometers of river. So my village, my community, Krenak community, we were facing the question, are you gonna live this land? Are you gonna go away now that you don't have your river anymore? Are you going to become refugees? And a silent answer came with the collective decision without any decision 
then no, if we are, if you are in front of a desert, don't run, go across it, go through it. And this is the true meditation. Oh, very well. I have some uh, some final announcements to make, and then I'll go back to you, Ayutum. So we're going to show a slide now. Jamie is going to do that for us. It's of our next talk. It's about animism and ecology. With two professors from Schumacher College from the UK, Stefan Harding from Holistic Sciences and Andy Letcher of Eco Engaged Ecology. So if you want to already check the QR, QR code, it takes already to the website uh, for enrollment for registration is on the 28th of May in the same format, a talk and then questions. People from Hong Kong uh, who want to go deeper uh, in the theme, there's going to be a course, online course that we've been running for four years now with Stefan, this professor. It's only for Hong Kong because there's an online component, but also an in person component. And for people from Hong Kong or near Hong Kong, we also have uh, the membership program for Kaduri. And last, uh, we're gonna send you over email, but you can see here as well, um, a link for feedback. We want to hear your comments. We want to improve. It's the first time we do a talk in a language that is not English or Chinese, so in Portuguese. It's the first time, so it's the first time actually we have a talk not in English in our series. We wanna know how was the experience so we can improve and continue. And we want to keep bringing diversity of languages and, and context to our talk. So after these announcements, I'll just uh, give the floor back to Ayutan. Thank you, of course, it's very, it's very hard as a facilitator to say anything after you, because I think it takes us actually to a place of silence, of, of careful listening. And I'm here like feeling very strange to having to do this announcement and go back to this kind of practical place after you invite us, invite our bodies to this willingness uh, that you talk about, this poetic willingness. It's something I thought was really beautiful that you said. So I just wanted to invite you to just have the floor back for a little bit and, and, and yeah, just share your final words for us and to say goodbye and take with us. So in the way you spoke, you already expressed this idea that maybe we could share now in our goodbyes. So the experience of having to deal with the practical communication with routine, with the daily life, It is welcomed. It doesn't remove us from the possibility of listening. It can be the experience of listening in the doing. Doing. We can be in the complexity of daily life and in the dealings with the things that might be objective or practical. 
we are capable of doing that without losing tenderness. And what I want is that all of you that gave me your attention, your time to have a wonderful day. That we can have many creative meetings like this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you again uh, for our next talk.